your great-grandfather, the 1881 census. And what did he do then? I mean, left school at a, about 12 years old from Stocking Farm. He, was, he then went straight into Carver Mill. I think he used to go to school in the morning and then go to the mill in the afternoon and then it, after that he stayed at the mill as a warehouse man for the rest of his life. That's my great-grandfather. He was from a, the, a Kerber family, he lived at... Uh, London Row Kerber, which is now called Hillside, which might have been specifically built to serve the cotton mm. mill at the time. And so then my grandfather, he was born at the same cottage, number 10 Hillside, and then he started in the mill, but then he went to work as the gardener at Cliff College. And I've got a couple of uncles from uh, my grandfather's family, uh, Percy and Hubert, and they went to work in Carver Mill all their lives, so... Uh, there's quite a strong connection with the mill. My great-grandfather went to the cotton mill and my grandfather, but the uh, later on my uncles went to the ordinary mill, Sittons. Now the interesting thing here, my other uh, great-grandfather, Jay Bardsley, he came from Stockport. He worked in the cotton industry in, in Stockport. And about 1900, um, he came to Carver with this family. And he came as a warehouse man as well. All so right. I had two great-grandfathers as warehouse men. <laughs> he could have occupied a fairly important position because they gave him the Derwent Cottage, the manager's house, which is on the riverbank. And he also had a car, which was rare in those oh, days. Yeah. It was a Model yeah. T Ford. Yes, so he, he lived there. So there was my great-grandfather and his wife, my grandfather and his wife, and five children. They also had a lodger, which was a teacher at <laughs> Kerber School. So there were quite a lot of people in Derwent Cottage. And what happened was, so John Bardsley came, that's the Stockport, yeah. and he came to that cottage, and his daughter, Elizabeth, married my grandfather, George Winterbottom, in June 1910. And as I say, everybody lived at Derwent Cottage. Look, there's, there's a warehouse on the ground floor, there's a warehouse on mm. the second floor, according to this. Mm. Oh, and there's another in the gas a large warehouse in the in the gas works. Yeah, they get all the raw cotton in, wouldn't they? Mm. In uh, one of the buildings, mm. and then they get the finished product in mm. another one. There was one occasion where, when they shut down, I forget what year it was, when it was uh, for a fortnight and they turned it because it was cold it's the you know they had the the cold it's story so that was uh, quite interesting for for locals to uh, to go around and have a look what was going off with the filming etc did you get involved in any of no, that no 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 i, I had my holiday <laughs> when there was up uh, on the roof we was allowed some of us just to go up and sit quiet and watch it. I was working in uh, London at the time, so it would be prior to 1970. Uh, but I did come up one weekend. The BBC were doing this cold it story, which still crops up now, and they wanted to uh, hire the mill for a week to do various uh, on-location shots. Gordon Sissons was alive at the time, and he says, certainly, the best time to come is Springbank Holiday Week, because we closed down for the week, and you can do what you like then. Uh, I went up one weekend, and the en entrance to Carver Mill, they got a sentry box, and uh, uh, an up and down barrier and things of that nature, and uh, I put one of the kids in the sentry box and took his photograph and all that sort of stuff. Um, and people were quite proud, the work people, they were quite proud that they'd been involved, chosen for this. And he then noticed when it was filmed that uh, a very clever choice of camera angles and limiting the width, it did look very, very authentic. And on one occasion, one episode of the Cold It Story, which was on for, um, you know, probably 13 weeks, something of that nature, uh, they had... Um, an escape sequence underneath the water wheel. So as the overflow from the goit, it backed down into the Derwent. And it looked a marvellous place for somebody to hide because there was a, an airspace at the back. So these poor devils had to go around the back and hide there while they'd be looked for by the German soldiers. Then of course we were invaded by the Nazis and uh, the swastika was flying 
noted by the local press. They got cobblestone, plastic cobblestones. There was um, cobblestones they'd put down, put all these cobblestones, but they were like plastic mats with cobble, very lifelike, you know. And all these German soldiers marching about all over the place. It was, it was quite good fun, really. As you, as you go to the mill, you, you see it end on. Then the southern elevation, that was where the, the photograph on the front of the paperback book was taken in front of that particular part of it. We got barbed wire and centre boxes and goodness knows what else. And uh, we were not cut coal rips, we were lawful cattle. And that was another prisoner of war camp. And anybody who escaped from there, or was naughty, they were then sent to Colditz. That's where the tie-up comes. And the last scene in our episode was in the... Have you ever looked inside the wheelhouse, as was? The, where, where you see the mountain blocks for the wheels. The last scene, if I remember right, is the prisoners who've escaped they climb up these mountain blocks as though they're going out and get arrested off to call it. All these people that do all these programmes of television they're a messy lot because we'd go in in the morning and your desk, all the lovely clean desk papers on your desk, there were footprints all over your paperwork plastic coffee cups all over the place Anyway, it was a bit of fun.